Transmitting from South Central Texas since 2007, this is Anomaly with Jen and Angela talking about your favorite sci-fi fantasy topics. We're the halfway point between Muggle and Geek. Anomaly, something that deviates from what is standard, normal, or expected. An oddity, peculiarity, irregularity, inconsistency, incongruity, a rarity. Hello and welcome to the Anomaly Podcast. I'm Jen. Hey, Angela's out for a while, but don't worry, she'll be back soon. In the meantime, thank you to our guests Rico Dosti from Treks and Sci-Fi and Rick Pete. He's an Anomaly listener, supporter, and friend of Angela and I. Red alert! This transmission of Anomaly contains spoilers for Brandon Sanderson's novel, Skyward. If you're looking for a non-spoiler review, please listen to part one first. Okay, guys, let's spoil it. Basically, this last vestiges of humanity out there in the stars. They're on some kind of weird planet that's surrounded with all this debris, and there's this enemy out there called the Krell that they have to constantly fight off. It pretty much follows the story of this young girl. I guess she's supposed to be like late teens, like 17, she's 17. something. Mm-hmm. Her father was this ace, you know, super pilot. The story goes when she was younger he betrayed uh, you know them she's got this big shadow kind of throughout her life of a huge battle that took place in the past that he chickened out and kind of took off and she's out to kind of prove that wrong she wants to get into flight school there's a lot of things that are getting in her way but she doesn't give up she runs into this um, old friend of her father's that kind of paves the way and helps her get into the to the school It's a lot about them learning how to fly these fighters and and the characters, her little uh, group, which is called Skyward. There you go. She kind of overreacts to a lot of things because she has this, you know, everyone calls her a coward. Everyone in her family is a coward. So she kind of overcompensates and she keeps people at arm's length a lot because of that and uh, is kind of a loner. She's out there on her own a lot on this planet. But then she slowly changes, you know, this squad becomes sort of a little group and they become friendly. And But there's so many obstacles for, for poor Spencer. You know, they won't even let her stay at the base, you know, or whatever, you know, with the other um, pilots to be, which is terrible. You know, she has to go out and live in this cave and all this stuff. And then during all this time, you know, as these these young, young uh, kids, I'll just say, are learning to be pilots, these these enemies are still attacking and they, that gets them just sort of like almost like Star Wars, which this has a very Star Wars feel to it. They get sort of swept up and have to go out there and start fighting really before they're ready at times. And that's hard to listen to because, you know, you know something bad's going to happen. You know, she loses some of her friends. And it's just really interesting to see how the her character and the other characters change and evolve over the over the course of the book. And you just you're just rooting for her so much, right? Even though she mm-hmm. kind of messes up sometimes, you kind of like, no, no, don't do that. I do like her name for jerk face, though. Yeah, I think I've heard you guys say that <laughs> yeah, before. Jerk, jerk face. Jerk face. <laughs> you know, there are these privileged. What are they called in the book, you guys? First, first, first c- citizens. First citizens yeah. who are the basically the children of people that were the pilots that were in this big battle of Alta, right? Yeah. They're sort of like like legacy, you know. They they get sort of into flight school period. Others have to take this massively difficult test, and so they're like the hoi polloi. If you guys know what that term is, they're no, explain. Kind of, hoi polloi is I don't know. Is that a real term, Rick? Pete, have you heard the term hoi polloi before? But I've heard yes. it. I, don't I, I yeah. use it. it. It's it's really from my love of the Three Stooges. But they're like the rich society people. You know, like okay, like yeah. they're the people who have the rich society parties. They're they they can't be bothered with the little people, and uh, they're the elite. And so Spencer thinks that you know th- those people and their children who are getting into flight school with you know no no problem, no test, and whatever. She puts them into a category like they're just all snobs, and uh, and she doesn't care for them, of course. So you know there there are all these obstacles that she has to overcome. But of course, she's an ace pilot, and. And she holds on to, you know, so much that her father wasn't wasn't a coward. And then it gets into this whole thing about 
there's something genetically different about uh, her father and, and possibly about Spencer herself. Yeah, she's having to wear, where all the kids have to wear flight suits and, and helmets when they get into the simulators, hers has sensors in it so that they can figure out what the defect is. Yeah, that what's they believe, wrong with her. The coward yeah. defect so they can yeah, that... detect it in other people and root them out before they become full pilots. Because as we find out later, something mysterious surrounds what happened with her father in that incident that branded him a coward. These people are not living very well. I mean, for the most part, some of them are okay They're just and better surviving. off, but, but, but a lot of them are just basically barely uh, getting by. Just getting by. And that's the interesting thing. It doesn't seem like there's an actual plan to win the war. They're just trying to keep the Krell from destroying them because they have basically like nuclear bombs that they're trying to drop on several of the communities there, which one of them is Igneous. Each clan from the ship they came from actually um, has a different cavern that surrounds Igneous. I think Igneous is the place where they build the ships, correct? Yeah, Igneous is where she's from, and that's where they build the ships. And then Alta is above Igneous. Going back in that history that we learned, the reason why they have all these different colonies and different caverns was because if there was too many gathered in one spot, it would usually trigger the Krell to come and bomb them. Right, so they had to be spread out all over the place on the ground so that they never, I guess, presented a big enough footprint to attract the Krell. Throughout the book, I'm wondering why don't they have a plan to win? And that ends up being something that the cadets start asking their teacher, who is Cobb, and he reminds me a lot of, what's his name from Hunger Games? Woody Harrelson plays him in the movie, Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. I can't remember what his name is, yeah. Haymitch. Haymitch. He reminded yeah. me of Haymitch. He's jaded. He's older. Yep. He, he used to be her dad's wingmate. Later right. in the story, you yeah. hear more about why he is the way he is. He won't fly. He teaches his students differently than the other flight instructors. He doesn't teach them how to use disruptors right away. He wants them to learn the um, essentials of flying and how to how to use yeah. the light, light lights, lance, which yeah. is super interesting technology for this book that they use to grab debris for use in their construction of their ships, but they also use it in their battles to swing around and to throw... Um, stuff into the enemies and yeah they can sort of use it as a kind of like a a grappling tractor yeah it's a a tractor beam or grappling hook kind of thing and they have smaller versions of it on their wrists that spencer uses to hunt uh, rats and she's not supposed to have it because it belonged to her dad and he gave it to her before he left what is another thing they use um pulses or EMPs. emp yeah yeah to bring down shields but then they have to like reboot their own shields after yeah, they do that. Right. Yeah, um, they have really interesting tactics. It would be very cool to see in a movie where they... Uh-huh. And, and it makes it a lot more of a team fight, you know, with these kinds of tactics. Because somebody has to sort of swing in, use their EMP, which puts them vulnerable. They lose their shield, right? And then they have to depend on, on somebody else in their in their team to, to shoot the other guy before basically they get shot. Because yes. uh, it takes them a minute or something to uh, reignite their shield. So there's a lot of teamwork, and it's a very uh, group type of flying rather than just a hot shot. And it, in even it shows in the in the early parts about the book of Spencer tries to be a little bit too much of a hot shot, and you kind of can kind of see it coming, but you you're happy when it happens. Is that she starts to work <laughs> with the other people yeah. more, right? They start to bond and they start to form a much more uh, cohesive team, while at the same time losing, you know. Cobb tells them, like at the beginning, what they'll be lucky with one or two of them graduate out of their group of what is it, 10 to start with, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and some he says, you'll wash out, you'll quit, and some might be not even alive anymore. And turns out to be pretty much true. Yeah, we lose yeah. two right off the bat in the same fight, right? So they, they're not supposed to be a part of the battles yet because they're still cadets, but the DDF, which is the, the leadership in the military, is so desperate at this point in the story, um, they're losing and they're, they really need pilots pilots and they're starting to use cadets now too so they were up in a training mission whenever the krell started attacking i think one of them had a bomb and the two of them were were killed during this huge battle yeah and it it hits spencer really hard it hits all of them very hard and cobb um you get to learn a little bit more about 
him during this time too. Yeah, and he's uh I like his character a lot. I really mm-hmm. did because the uh he's hard with all of them, but for a good reason. He pushes them hard to be the best so that they don't die. He doesn't want them to die. And and that, you know, shows that he really he actually even though he kind of comes off sometimes as he doesn't care, but he really he actually cares probably more than than most. And he really feels you know, sort of a bond to Spencer because like you said, Jen, that's the daughter of his old wingmate. And even though it comes out, you know, later on about things aren't quite what they've been reported, there were things that happened with the aliens that that messed them up and and she is sort of affected by it. I, I like the fact that even though things weren't great, he still gives her a chance. If you're enjoying getting weekly releases of Anomaly, please consider donating five, ten, or more dollars a month to help us with the cost of editing and hosting the show. We're in need of about $60 more per episode to edit and master our shows. We're getting super busy these days with work and family, and in order to keep Anomaly rolling on a consistent basis, we need to pass the production responsibilities on to a professional. If you can help, even just a little, We'll thank you on the show, add you to a supporters page on our website, and send you the full version of the original Anomaly intro music, television segment track, and the outro. You'll also get a chance to be a guest on the show when we have listener roundtables. As always, thank you to everyone who's listening. Thanks again to those of you who already support the show. And of course, thank you to those of you who are subscribed, digging what we're doing, and sharing our episodes. We couldn't do this without you. To donate on a monthly basis, all you have to do is head over to AnomalyPodcast.com and click on Donate at the top of the page. He, of anyone, knows that even the most, except for like Ironsides, right? Even though he was right there and he knows that her father had, you know, something happen to him, that he's still going to give her a chance. And he still knows and recognizes that she's a great pilot, that she has... You know, the ability to pull people together, too. You start to see her leadership come into play. We're all rooting for her. And then, you know, at some point early on in the book, she finds this crashed ship that's unlike any other ship that that's out there. Uh, M-Bot. Yeah, I love good old M-Bot, which is yes. – there is nothing more fun or, or there probably are more fun things. But, but you know, when you find something that has a – computer personality kind of a, a, a which this this ship has sort of a artificial let's call it artificial intelligence artificial personality and that just leads to all kinds of fun stuff i cannot actually feel things for you spencer but let me try to cheer you up yeah. you know and then he <laughs> and he'll make some stupid dumb joke or whatever you, you look have, very good you today have, spencer you, you have nice How is, shoes <laughs> yeah you have nice shoes <laughs> i get you that's right that's what he says uh, you know like you have nice shoes i gave you a compliment you should feel better now spencer yeah. <laughs> and uh I, that that part was great with how that happens and you know she finds this ship and then her friend raj is that how you say his name Riggs. raj rage raj rig rig yeah. Um, but anyway, he uh, he he tried to be a pilot, even though he really didn't, you know, wasn't for him. But he ends up um, repairing the ship with Spencer because he ends up. We find out pretty quickly that he's basically a, a pretty much an ace engineer. Plus, he gets involved in the engineering areas at the base so he can get access to tools and parts and stuff. And he ended up getting the highest score out of all of the cadets. So he gets recruited right away, like you were saying, by the people who make and design the ships. But when she finds this crashed ship and once she starts to investigate it a little and it's advanced and it has this artificial intelligence and I'm like, oh, she's going to fix this thing up somehow and it's going to yeah. be, be important to the story. And of course, it, that's what happens. But- the not way the it, way we think. Not yeah. quite the way we think, right? I, and and uh, which I I like the fact that we. That's one of, another point of the way he writes his books a lot. He'll he'll sort of set you up like, yeah, this is the way it's going, but it will kind of go that way. But there'll be a little spin on it that that is unique, and and I really like uh, that you get a little surprised by. So. With Mbot, you know, that that's sort of what happens. And by the end of the book, did we really still know exactly where that ship came from? Yeah. The pilot that he had before was human, 
it was a part of maybe a fleet the earlier, before the war because they yeah. crashed on detritus 80 years before. And I think this ship is even older than that. That ship was created by humans back during the big, you know, I don't, why don't we want to call it the intergalactic war. Yeah. But, you know, when Earth basically went to war with everybody else in the galaxy. So when technology <laughs> was more advanced than they are now. Yes. Because Correct. they've lost so much since they've been on the, you know, run kind of. And, you know right. what it kind of reminded yeah. me of that part of it? It reminded me of Battlestar Galactica. A lot the of this does technology, actually. Technology, yeah. yeah, has been lost due to the fact that you've got this big so enemy trying trouble. to wipe humanity out. You know, so there's there's a lot of Battlestar feel to this. Yeah, Nimbot reminded me of Data from TNG, <laughs> right? Because, and he doesn't understand necessarily all of the human you know idiosyncrasies around relationships and emotion and all of that. So he's a perfect foil to what's going on inside of Spencer what's happening to Spencer, right? So he doesn't understand. So he gets to be the person, he gets to be the reader to ask the questions that we are asking because it makes perfectly good sense for him to ask it because he doesn't get, why are you upset about this? And why is it, why, why are you even doing this? So I like that he's in a way, in a way a father figure for her from a support perspective, just like Cobb is, a, is in a way a father figure yeah. for her. Right. So you've got these two totally different personalities who are basically there to support her. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the fact that in pot, there's a, there's a, there's a scene in a book where Spencer goes and talks to her grand, her grandmother and her grandmother explains to her the significance of the gift, you know, of, of something that her great grandmother had, which allowed ships back in the day to, travel large spaces of you know large distances instantaneously almost like from the battle galactic uh, jump concept right it um, also helped to work on the ships because it was her clan that had it you know this talent that allowed them to uh, they were the the that worked on the engines so her great grandmother had it i really believe that her that her grand has it um yeah and her father has it, and yeah. now she has it. And I remember thinking that when, I, when they first talked about the Mbot, and they were talking about his systems, and there's this one system that I can't remember, was it the Cytonic Drive or something mm -hmm. like that, that was offline, and Rick could never figure out where it is. Like, what what is this thing? I can't find it anywhere in the ship. And it turns out that this has this human component, in order for it to work. And as soon as they had that scene with Gran, then I knew it was her. Like she was that piece. And even though she didn't know it, yeah, you know, and we don't see integrates. that till the end of the, end of the book. Yeah. But I, I really you almost called it a that. movie. <laughs> I almost called it a movie. Right? Yeah. But it is. Yeah. I, I, I really like that ship. And I know at the end of it, I kept thinking, I can't wait till the second book. Cause I want to see what happens. And, you know, and one of the things I hope doesn't happen, honestly, in the next book, I don't want all the DVS ships to have Embot's capabilities. I mean, they could have better shielding, maybe, but I don't want them to have all the stuff that he has. I think that sets him apart, and as a as a as a as a writing vehicle, I think they should keep that. I, I thought that was really well done, and the way he they introduce it, and and she grows, sort of as Embot is getting repaired, she's growing in her ability as a pilot in flight school. Yeah. So they both get to a certain point, and then they get to a certain point, and then Mbot's like, you know what? I'm shutting down because you're going to get me fighting, and I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't do that. Yeah, his you know, directive his, is not to fight. Yeah, my prime directive is I don't fight, and so I'd rather shut down and be and and, and not do anything than be dragged into that. And I thought that was, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. You know, and forcing her to think about that. And then I obviously like, at the end, you know, he makes a human choice. I do Mbot's love story. how you, you picked up on the fact that Mbot is going through a transition sort of at the same time as Spencer, because she's not only changing as far as her abilities as a pilot, but also in how she thinks and how she gets along with others, you know, and also what she's learning at the same time about her dad. Because this is basically an action-packed sci-fi mystery. There's like a big piece of the puzzle that's missing throughout the story. And we need to find out why everyone thinks her dad's a coward and what really happened. And Imbot kind of also is helping her figure out where they came from. Because nobody understands really a lot about Earth. They just have these stories that Gran Gran um, tells 
Spencer that she is so it's so essential to who she is. She identifies with the warriors and the stories that her her grand grand tells. At some point, she you know she becomes a little bit more wise. Spencer does, and says, you know, how can I be related to all those people? They're all from different cultures, and some of them aren't even maybe real people. And she said, but they're from Earth, and you're from Earth, and they're part of your DNA, basically. So, like I said, they don't know a lot about where they came from or why they're. There, they just have a like a limited memory, and Imbot kind of helps Spinza put some of that together because she hears music for the first time because of Imbot. Yeah, they don't have time to make art because they're just trying to survive. They couldn't have a whole bunch of people gathered to make music because that would attract the Krell, and the Krell would attack. So, yeah, it's funny. I, it's funny as you say that because I'm thinking, you know, she's learning and growing, and and things are becoming more clear to her. And Mbot's writing new supper teams to do this, writing new yes. supper teams to do that. So he's improving himself, and at the same time, she's improving herself. When I when I when I think about the end of the book, and I wonder, the second book, man, that's got a lot to deal with. It's got a lot to unpack. What really happens when Spencer? Because at the end of the book, Spencer has this experience that her father had, and they fly out into space to see what's on the other side. That's something we haven't talked about. They can't even leave the planet because the Krell keeps them back, and the debris field prevents them from leaving. But you were saying, as you were saying, she's able to do as her dad did and break through that barrier. They have this experience with the Krell, and Embod is able to pull down some information out of the Krell systems. That was the only part of the movie of the book that I thought, really? That easily? I don't that, think that, it was that, that easy. <laughs> it wasn't, remember, because they were. He was like, "Let me break into their oh in, and yeah. now I'm out." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He didn't. He didn't get very much. He, he, yeah. They, but, they. But, he got in, but then he got slammed back out. Like, but what he brought, what he did get, is a ton of the history that these people don't have. That they don't. They, they didn't know what they didn't know what the curl were. Well, now. They know what the curl's purpose is. Yes. Right? So there's, and I'm sure there's more than what we were told in the book of what all he brought back, right? Mm -hmm. But that's going to cause ripples in their society for a lot, for a long time. Just that little information would totally change the perspective of who the curl are, what their purpose is. To me, that was a huge revelation to put at the end of the book to lead into the second book. So I really want to see where this, what this revelation, what, what comes to pass. Obviously, she has this gift that they're probably still afraid of because they were afraid of it even before they got to this planet. The, the officer's relationship to the engineers, you know, and to her great grandmother who had the gift, it was already a difficult relationship. They were already afraid, you know, maybe envious, Maybe worry that the people who have this gift would would you know somehow maybe revolt and be and, and take control or take power or whatever. Spencer probably isn't the only one who has the gift. Definitely right? not. So now instead of squelching these people, they can't squelch them anymore. They well, they realize, need them. Yeah, they may yeah. be the key to actually winning and planet. leaving that yeah. ball of dust and rock. She obviously, near the end, in the last, you know, big battle and all that, you know, she starts to be able to hear them, kind of anticipate what they're going to do. She seems to be able to resist this control that happened to her father. You want, like, about every pilot to be like her, right? Pretty much right. by the end. Uh, you know, I think Mbot, like you said, Rick, about... We'll have to see what they do and what they can adapt to the other ships uh, in the next book because Mbot seems to have the ability to sort of filter out the way they were trying to con- – what what they did and control their father because he was in a normal whatever regular ship will say. So, he puts up some kind of barriers or filters or whatever that blocks – their control, right? So yeah. she gets sort of like some of the good stuff. She can learn what they're going to move and how they're because they operate sort of like a hive kind of a, a thing a little bit where those other ships that are out there fighting against them are being sort of controlled. They're not like independently thinking pilots. They and well, they call and, them drones. So yeah, I'm yeah. Not even yeah. Sure there's people. So, so the you know point being, like you said, Jen, I think is that and, and Rick that if there are others out there, I don't think it's going to be very many. I, no, I, it's kind of like think, Jedi. In I the think force. it's going to be pretty darn rare. But there may uh-huh. be others that have this 
this ability or this, you know, they keep calling it a defect, but, it, you know, it's it's not really a defect. It's an advantage because not only does it help her fight the Krell, it's also their only basically way in the future off the planet because it allows her, you know, more or less spore drive, hyper drive, whatever other little way of jumping across the galaxy you want to call it. Without that, they're stuck there pretty much. There's that critical, very cool point. The last, you know, bit of the of the battle, you know, was pretty exciting and, and emotional and, you know, where she just jumps, but she doesn't really realize what she does. Everything's starting to go bad and, and it looks like she's going to die, you know, all of a sudden blink. Yet any more pilots they can find like that would be great, <laughs> I just think. And uh, so uh, I, I wanted to say, so did we ever think that she was going to kiss jerk face? Yes. I, need, I need to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I need to bring that up because they kept dropping these little hints like, Hmm, maybe jerk face isn't so bad. How come I feel these funny feelings when I'm around jerk face? <laughs> Spencer, are you falling in love with no but but <laughs> but I, I just was like there was that one last scene where uh, they were talking and I'm like, uh oh. What does Chris say on your show? Book sex. Well, they, I yes. didn't think that was going to happen. Because no, no. Brandon it, Sanderson never puts that in his book. You know, it, well, I mean, it was, it, you know, they're they're like teens. That would have been kind of pushing it a bit. He kind of, I think they hugged a few times, a couple of nice hugs. But I was just like, are they putting these two together? Well, we'll, we'll see what happens in the next book. Yeah. yeah and when, I, she's not, when she's not decking him, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, true. I got to where I liked Jorgen. Uh, yeah, face because he because kind of sticks up for her eventually. He he, he's does. a jerk at first, of course, but they all have their own problems that they're dealing with. And even though he comes from privilege, his whole life is scheduled for him, and his parents have like decided his path for him. And all he wants to do is be helpful and help his people survive. And he and Spencer discover they both basically have the same motivation, and they have to learn to get along at first, and then they become friends. And it kind of feels like they're warming up to a, re a relationship status. But uh, we'll have to see how that goes, because I think Sanderson's pretty good at, you know what I mean? Like he, yeah. he likes curveballs. So we'll have to see about that. They did a good job with her interacting with all the rest of the, the, the squadron. I was a little surprised. I don't know about either of you, but I was a little surprised at how it was fairly uh, ruthless where, you know, hey, there's another one that's going to get killed and there's another one dead and there's another, oh, you yeah. know, like. That's why it felt like the Hunger Games at times. You know, it was, uh, they did pull too many punches on it. He was telling us and showing us that this is not good. It's dangerous. Yeah, it's yeah. very dangerous. And, and the fact that they were putting these pilots out there. The last vestige of humanity is on detritus right now. They're fighting for survival and becoming quite desperate. And how much did we all hate Ironsides? <laughs> or, oh, my gosh. Or were you guys sort of like, she's sort of- She has by a the very end, hard job. <laughs> yeah, she's got a hard job, but she was, we all have kids, you know, I have a hard time thinking that for someone to be that hard with, with a kid, even if their father, her father ran from this battle, but- you know, and it doesn't turn out that everybody is like on her, like you're not responsible for what your father, your mother did or whatever. But Ironsides is just like all over her. She's afraid. Yeah. And being afraid makes people do things like that. But sure. also it speaks yep. to the unique situation of their planet right now and the colony in that they take kids and they make them warriors. I mean, right out of high school or whatever, there's not a lot of coddling going on because people have to survive so and and also like i said she's afraid she was basically jorgen to chaser um spence's dad in their squadron mm -hmm. and she saw what happened he did not flee the battle he turned on them after going through the debris field into space and coming back down changed and that defect that they're so worried about they believe is hereditary and the the lie that they had told about her dad being a, a uh, coward ended up being a way to protect Spencer and her family from what really happened because it would yeah, have been sort so of, much right. worse. And yeah. so the way she treats Spencer is to protect people from what she believes could happen with Spencer. Although I was never really completely clear on why it was so important for them to not say what really happened. 
it, it, it's it, part it, of the mystery. That's that well, would be I, a little bit, but I mean, it's like okay, this battle happened. It's all been been recorded, right? She gets that recording of the battle and finds out that no, he didn't just run. He 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 left, but then he comes back and 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 I was like, okay, all right, I get you sort of lied about that, but I don't think the military would do it just to like protect a girl of the guy who did that, you know, like in other words, so well, well there's defined. a lot of different yeah. reasons. There's yeah. a lot of different there's reasons. A lot because, of reasons yeah. yeah. Because not only are, is, is Judy Ironsides maybe protecting the family from the fate of what would have happened if everyone knew that her father was a traitor, but also there could be widespread panic if people realize that whatever made him do that could be in any one of them. And then they won't trust each other. In order to succeed, they have to rely on one another. Yeah, so, that's true. They they seem to be uh, implying that it's only maybe is very few people that have this whatever they want to call it. Uh, they don't have any way to detect it, right? So well, they sort of do think, by the end. They, they, well, they, yeah, they, but the only person they can really test this on is Spencer. Well, so, so far, I, so, so far, far because right. they need a control. They need to know what to right. look for before they can start looking for it in everyone else, right? But since her father is the only one that, that had this happen, right? This is the first time that we know of that a pilot has betrayed his own people and shot down his own people. Well, they after. had that mutiny on the ship, remember? That they yeah, but they don't. I don't even think that. I doubt any of them even. I mean, I think her grand they, remembers that. Yeah, they kind I of bet. blame though. They blame the engineers for. They blame the engineers. Yeah, yeah. They, they all, blame everybody who has this ability, basically, yeah. right? They, because this ability gives them both the ability to to jump. I think this ability was buried. You have to figure that maybe you know the generation, like the grandmother generation, they may still remember about what this is, but they are clearly not teaching this from generation to generation. So this knowledge about this gift is is probably largely gone. I mean, Ironsides doesn't understand what this gift is either. She just is worried that now the crowd have the ability to control our people. So we don't want them to get too far high because then the, the crowd will turn them into weapons and they'll come and they'll start shooting our people down, right? So I think they, they're developing this methodology using her as their guinea pig because she's related to Chaser. They're going to figure out how to f- test for this so then we can weed these people out of the DDF so that we don't have to worry about this happening a second time. Yeah, right? except I, I think, like I was saying earlier, that they actually have to weed them into the DDF. <laughs> Well, now because, they, yeah, they totally do. Because, yeah. you know, it gives her a huge advantage. And in, in, if they can figure out how to replicate, maybe not MBOT, but that jump drive thing, just think about what happens in Discovery, you know, when you can just jump away from a battle and jump behind well, your it's, enemy or well, whatever. It's not, so. just, it's not just the ability to jump from point to point. Sure. And it's yeah. instant. But also, she's she almost has force ability where she anticipates the moves yep. of the Krell. Yeah. But we realize that the Krell are mechanical. Because at the end of the story, we find out that they are drones that the um, jailers use because they're not warriors. And they right. send these drones in. And so it's possible she's able to detect them because they're machinery and she's anticipating. I didn't get the idea them. that they were total machinery. Did you guys both get that idea? Yeah. That, that, they're, uh, that, that all those yeah. ships were just totally all mechanical? I didn't. Well, I they, thought they, they were both. I thought they were sort of like a Cylon thing where there was. Organic and mechanical, I guess. I, 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 well, I think, the well, I think that that's why they the didn't ship. know much about them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could just, you know, feed everyone the, the whole plot of the book. But, uh, but yeah, really great. Uh, I got pretty worked up and pretty emotional during that whole last battle scene and then Cobb coming in out of the blue. And it was just, I was like, I was in my car and I'm like literally like cheering to my, you know, <laughs> yes, yay. That's you what know, I like I'm doing too. the data. Oh, man. I'm doing she, the data fist in the air kind exactly. of, you know. She gets shot down twice before. Is, is it only twice? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think so. Yeah, she yeah. gets in her she own ejected ship. ejected the is, first time. Yeah, ejected yeah. the first time. The second one, she gets in this dinged up thing. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, exactly. And, and somehow she's Imbot. still managing to, to stay ahead of these guys even in that old ship, yeah. yeah or mess, or she, not old ship, but but damaged uh, damaged ship, yeah. And at the end, I love how she comes in. I could picture it, a blip on our radar that uh, Iron Sign that? Sides is watching on the control center. You know, it's What's kind of like I see the space on Star Wars when everyone's gathered around the holograph of all the X-Wings oh, yeah. going after yeah. the Death yeah. Star watching. And then 
they realize it's the defect. They're scared at first. It's and like then, iron size. How, I can't get rid of you. You keep, yeah. you keep popping up. Yeah. <laughs> but she's so glad because all of the pilots are basically being wiped out. And the only ones left are the ones they, 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 they skyward and they cut. Yeah. Yeah. Or who quit, like Kimmelin, who I love, is a sniper. And they never let her use those abilities because one of the tactics of the Krell is to go after who they presume is the most talented in, in the squadron. Her strategy throughout training was to hang back and snipe from a distance because she doesn't have the um, piloting skills that most of the other cadets have. And she becomes a liability at one point, which gets Hurl killed. Ugh, and to have that happen to her... It was, but they all bond together at the end, you know, they're all like running for ships, you know, you have all this playing in your mind like a movie of, yeah. uh, you know, they're running for what's his name's, the the other rich kid who has, they have private ships and like, doesn't your family have some private ships you can just <laughs> grab and use? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go get those. <laughs> well, they, Ironside's called for the families to send their private ships in as backup, but they all fled. They all they're left. leaving. So yeah. it ends up that so everyone who ostracized, cowards. everyone who, uh, right, ostracized Spence and her family are actually cowards too. They're just human, which is something that Kimmelin brings up at one point when Spence admits to her and to uh, Hurl and um, who's the girl who's the um, pacifist. I can't think of her name at this point. It's escaping me, but they kind of sneak her into their quarters because she's not allowed to right. stay with the pilots. She has to stay. Oh, yeah, in right, right. Bill. That's a great part of it where they, they she, basically pull, yeah, let her yeah, come in. They yeah, they sneak her in and then she can. Ne- she decides never to let them do that again because she doesn't want them to be in trouble for it. But anyway, she admits to them that she feels scared sometimes. And Kimmelin goes, you mean you're human? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's one part that I had, you know, like when everyone says coward, 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 and I'm like, uh, are you guys, everyone's afraid at some time. Time, yeah. Right? So it's 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 like that. I don't, you know, but uh, no, it was it, really. That's the difference between someone who is a hero and someone who is just stupid, who just goes into things, you know, guns a blazing. Because <laughs> heroes always have a little bit of fear that they have to overcome, you know, to save people. And... Yeah, you don't want to not have that because you want to want to not get killed. So I was gonna say, you, it keeps you, you like, alive. If, yeah. you, if you if you don't be a, if you're not a little afraid, you're just going to go in there and you're going to mess up and and that. So. Uh, there's a lot in the book, but it's it's really it flows well. It, it's all handled real well. I, I I like. There wasn't any stuff in there that I'd be like, oh, we didn't really need to know about this, or it's 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 you know, this guy's a great writer, and it shows. So uh, yeah, v- very much excited to read the next one, and uh, happy to to talk about it. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to the next one too. And Mr. Sanderson, if by any chance you're listening to this episode, contact us. We'd love to have you on the show. Find Any an email link and just, you know, figure out a way to send your link to this show once you post it up. Yeah, yeah. I, I have emailed him once um, to ask for an interview, but he's super busy. But he's anyway. got to write these books as quick as he does because oh, he, he writes he's fast. He's a writing machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he doesn't just put out anything either. It's amazing yeah. how much talent it takes to not only, you know, write that many, be so prolific, but write such good books. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if uh, I mean, I'm hoping that most people listening now, you know, have actually read it uh, that aren't, I, you know, I, I think we said some things, but maybe not too many big, I mean, Spoilers. I guess, spoil, I mean, there's, <laughs> I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know how to balance it really, you know, when you you're can't. into this section, I know people do listen, but still go, go read it if you haven't, it's, it's real good. So uh, we want you to be able to join this conversation too. You're not just a listener. You're part of this group. We want you to feel comfortable enough to write in and chime in, you know, with your points on the book. And you can do that by sending a voice memo recorded on your smartphone or smart device, or you can email us the old fashioned way and send it to girlygeeks at gmail.com. That's girlygeeks with a Z at gmail.com. You can also call our voicemail line at 432 363 4742, and we will play it on the show and respond. Thank both of you for coming on and yeah, for hanging out with me today and talking about this book, and for Rico for your patience <laughs> because we oh, were like, "Oh no, that's fine." I, uh, Let's do this, and then we didn't want to. We couldn't record right away, and ended up that Rick and I had finished it before you and had to go back and listen to it twice. But you know, it was such a pleasure to read or listen to it two times. It was not 
that big of a deal. But Yeah, the second time around was just as fun as the first. Yeah, I hope that next time we can do another Sanderson book, maybe the Stormlight Archive, or Angela and I want to um, start covering the Wheel of Time from the beginning again, because we've already done A New Spring, and we did um, the first book in the series, but we kind of stopped. It's about to become a television series on Amazon Prime, and we're thinking about either starting a whole series on the Wheel of Time or starting a Wheel of Time podcast. We're not sure. Uh-oh. We'll have to figure Uh-oh. that out. But we would love to have you guys read that with us. Rico, I know it was hard for you to get through when you were reading <laughs> them, but I promise you the audiobooks add a whole other dimension to the story, and it's so much yeah, more Yeah, I'd, I'd have to enjoyable. skip ahead to the to the later books then, because, yeah, I, I got to book six Bogged or seven down. or something, and I was like, ah, I'm out. I have one laying here that's been laying here for like 10 years. Which then one I'm, is that? Oh, I can't see it from where I'm at in my, uh, if I move, uh, but it's, it, I think it was about book seven or something, and I, and yeah. I got about halfway through it. it most of them are really big. I mean, I love that series. I think one of the hard things for me was it just starts out really strong and then it just sort of like meanders a lot in the middle. And and everyone that I've always talked to from what you've said and other people have always said like, yeah, it does sort of do that in the middle, but then it gets a lot better. You know, that's what they've mm-hmm. all, they've and all And then it really... goes out with a bang. Yeah, awesome. bang. No, so. I'd be happy to, you know, do another, like, um, if there's something you want to want to cover, you know, do like what you did last time and Hopefully, I can slide it into my book queue or reading, and uh, and then then we can do this. Yeah, it's uh, it's always fun to talk about books. Books are uh, great, and uh, and especially these days with audio, I think it adds a lot. And so many of these um, books, especially this this one we just talked about, are, are very visual or, mm-hmm. or or cinematic. You know, so many uh, things like uh, you know, reading. You always just you know you 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 do sort of imagine it in your brain, but. When you're listening to somebody speak, I think it adds, it makes that process, I think, even a little bit easier in a way where you're listening to the the story and then that the audio part helps you uh, sort of imagine it. It was a lot of fun to talk to you guys today. Just Star- everyone should Star watch Trek Star Trek and- Discovery because it's yes. so good. <laughs> it is so <laughs> good so this much. season. Oh and Orville is actually pretty good too. I don't know if both of you, I'm sure that, I think Rick, you you watch that. Do you watch Absolutely. Orville? Absolutely. Absolutely, Jen, I, do. I don't remember. No, you... because like I said, I, I don't have live TV. Yeah, um, that's what um, I thought. I, I wasn't so. sure if you had any other service or anything that that you know, like Hulu or something that has. That, yeah, but... just Amazon, Netflix, and uh, C- the CBS all. So they never thing. got season one of Orville on Netflix. No, I don't know. It's not up there. I don't there know. Yet. Maybe on Hulu. Yeah. That I think it's on Hulu. But yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's been pretty good. Pretty good this season. Uh, but yeah, Discovery's great. I I, I like it uh, very much this year, and uh, the last episode was pretty pretty crazy. These episodes are 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 fun, but boy, they're they're kind of complicated when you think about it a little bit. And I I I don't want to say anything or spoil anything, but when you watch the most recent one that was just on a couple of day, days ago, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's uh, good stuff. Too too many good things to watch on. I know. <laughs> I was watching a show. Uh, recently called Homecoming. It has Julia Roberts in it. It's on Amazon Prime. It's so is good. that a series? It's a series, and oh it, yeah, maybe I did hear about that. Yeah, it's so good. It's it's kind of a, uh, a it's mystery as well. Though, right? It's it's a little bit in that um, the technology they're using wipes the memory and reboots soldiers. Oh. Okay, yeah, and, and so it's, sort of programmable soldiers. Yeah, or? yeah, it's oh. it's a mystery. I don't want to give too much away, but it has a, such an interesting cinematic feel to it. It feels yeah. like an Alfred Hitchcock. Just the way they set up the the scenes and the music. They pan away from the shot and like go to black, and you can uh-huh. still hear the scene going on when the credits are rolling. And it's just great directing Good. and everything. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. It's called Homecoming. I actually really like watching um, this show called SWAT. I remember <laughs> watching SWAT back in the 70s as a kid, and they rebooted that series, and I, I think it's actually very well done. So I do like watching that, but I, I watch everything. I watch NCIS, which I still really enjoy watching. Um, not watching as many of the of the Netflix shows as much, I, I, I'm at a point where I think there's about eight shows that I watch, and just staying on top of those is difficult. Yeah. So adding, adding new shows, I just I just don't have the bandwidth for it. Yeah. Um, I do watch. There's a show that I actually really do like called Blackish, which is a 
it's a African American sitcom uh, comedy, but it has a lot of it tries to bring to um, the conversation a lot of issues that are going on with race in you know in the United States, mm-hmm. um, and it does it it does it in a you know in a way that I think is consumable and allows you to look at that and then have a conversation you know about what was presented. So I actually like watching that particular show, and you know Rico just did a whole a, a podcast on. You know, all of the shows that are on the CW. So and many I, shows. So, so many. many shows. <laughs> so you've got, you know, between Flash and Arrow. And I do watch Black Lightning, by the way. Supergirl. Um, and Supergirl. I mean, all of, the, all of, of those tomorrow. shows I watch, you know. And it's interesting, Rico, you talked about the Black Lightning show. I think I think the Black Lightning show, uh, the audience for that show, I think is a little bit different than the audience for – you know, Supergirl or Flash. So I know for, for me as a person of color, I get that show because um, it's really about, you know, living in their neighborhood in that, in that city. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah, and understood. Yeah. So it's really about that and the superhero piece of it and the powers are factored into that as a response. But the show isn't really about, it's not really about the powers. So yeah. it's a different kind of show. I don't think everybody um, necessarily would, would plug into it, but I think it's doing pretty well ratings wise. But uh, yeah, there's so much, there's so much content out there that, uh, which is, I mean, I'm it's, a, go it's see a good the, time uh, to be alive because there's so yeah, much stuff to see. For a nerd, for sure. For a geek or a nerd. Yeah. I'm trying to go see tomorrow um, that Battle Angel Alita movie. I don't know if you either of you guys have seen the previews I'm, for that. I'm seeing it, it at 7.30 tonight. <laughs> oh, are you? Okay. Oh, yeah. Is it the one with the animated uh, character that's in yeah, the game? That's yeah, I think Android? James Cam- Cameron's involved in it. Are you, yeah. are, are you seeing it in 3D, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not doing that. So, uh, yeah, I don't, even though they, they, uh, you know, it's sort of a little bit more designed for 3D, I'm still, nope, nope, but I am going to try to go see that tomorrow. And then we have Captain Marvel next month. Oh, yeah. Angela so. and I are going to be doing a Avengers, the Women of Avengers um, episode coming up soon in preparation for the uh, Marvel, Captain Marvel movie. Oh, that should so, be excellent. Looking forward to that. Yeah, we would love to have some contributions from you if you want. If you have any points about any of the Marvel women, do call in or write us an email. They're all We'd love dead. To include them. <laughs> <laughs> no, all that's, of them. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. Yeah, yeah. Captain Marvel. Black Black Widow is fine. Captain Marvel. I wonder what. Is fine. I wonder about the mutants. You know. They never talk about them in the Avengers, but you know they occupy the same universe because it's Marvel. Right? Well, that's that's because the that that's a that's a whole podcast on its own, Jen. But that that's oh, really? basically because the the two movie areas have have been owned by different places. Uh, so the the bottom line, although that's been slightly changed now, so so it looks like there may be a possibility to have the X-Men and mutants cross over with the other Marvel characters, but that, that would yeah. be great. Cause I know storm would they've, be, uh, oh, wow. yeah, okay. they've, they've had to keep them separately for, for up until this point. So, uh, but yeah, no, that sounds like a fun show. Yeah. If you let me, give me a heads up, uh, uh, before you guys do it and I'll, I'll try to send you a little audio blurb or something. Sure. It was Every, good to have you on. Yeah. I'm glad I, yeah. We have to do this again at some point. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to, um, to talking, you know, maybe, uh, at, at the very least, well, we should definitely plan on getting together after the next book and, and doing another uh, book two of uh, Skyward or whatever the name of the book will be. But uh, yeah, let's do that. All right. Well, that's it for this transmission of Anomaly. Stay subscribed and listen next week for the return of Angela and another fun sci-fi fantasy topic. Episode nine, <laughs> the return of Angela. Angela strikes back. <laughs> they, they have not. They, that, is that why they haven't announced the movie title yet for episode nine? Because they're, they're trying to get Angela to sign off on it. Spoiler and, alert. Uh oh. <laughs> Angela strikes back. Okay. Thank you again, guys. I'm Jen, and you've been listening to Anomaly, the halfway point between Muggle and Geek. Bye. 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 (laughs) All right. Thanks again to Rico Dosti from Trex and Sci-Fi. You can check out his show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and at trexsf.com. And thanks to Rick Pete for listening, supporting the show, and joining me in this review of Skyward. Just a heads up, I've been sick for the past week or two, 
and haven't felt like getting together with Angela to record. In order to give myself time to record and edit our next episode about the women of Marvel, which I'm hoping that you'll send your comments in for, next week I'll be uploading an archived episode from 2010 that is currently only available in our episode archive at AnomalyPodcast.com. It was a fun discussion about the comical third season episode of The X-Files entitled Jose Chung from Outer Space. Please head over to AnomalyPodcast.com and click on subscribe at the top of the page to make sure you never miss an episode. As always, you can contact us there at AnomalyPodcast.com. That's A-N-O-M-A-L-Y podcast.com. Or you can call our voicemail line at 432-363-4742. You can also shoot us a voice memo using your smartphone at girlygeeks at gmail.com. That's girlygeeks with a Z at gmail.com. We also like regular old emails, so make sure you send those along. Thanks again for listening. This is Jen, signing off. I noticed, I wanted to say before I forgot, when I listened especially to your last uh, anomaly, I wanted. I wanted to say. I, I've noticed your subtle changes on your. Uh, uh, you're not not female and fandom converge anymore, huh? You dropped. No, that? yeah, we dropped it because. Um, you're trying to keep the, or go. You tell me. You, you, oh well, over the years, what we considered was anomaly um, has changed, and we realize that you know we have a good like 50 50 split of women and men listening to the show and a lot of men call themselves anomalies and also and also angela's always hated where female and fam fandom converge she says it sounds like a sanitary thing (laughs) (laughs) oh wow okay wow now that now that's in my head because I've I've never I've never put well, that Well originally together. it made it made sense originally because our first logo was an eclipse, the earth in front of the sun, the two converging and and you know, it was the O and anomaly, but our logo changed and um incorporated the Andorian pigeon because that was like show art one time and everybody loved it so much we created a logo for it. But Angela has always hated the Andorian pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> so now I have to develop a new logo that has none of that in there. <laughs> wow, Angela. I know. <laughs> Angela strikes back. Okay. I liked listening to your uh, to your last one, Al- although I think I posted it up for you guys. It, you did miss or you, when you, you must have edited it. I know. Out. I missed yeah. it. I have to cut it back in and, and uh, put it back up in the show. Hopefully, it'll update for everyone. But, yeah, I was um, wondering if you, I, I was curious, did did you record those at different times? Yes. Um, uh, well, we see, recorded yeah. the show all at once. And then there was a segment we were talking about New Eden that um, we were going to try to approach it from the angle, you know, that about the religious aspects of the, the show and what we thought about that. And we weren't really re- prepared for it. And we thought, let's re-record that and we'll make a separate episode all about how star trek handles religion in another show and we'll prepare for it better because that has to be done well for it to be you know entertaining to anyone sure and so we we redid that and then we recorded the not this episode the one before that right after we watched it so yeah i had a bunch of clips i had to like put in and i missed that one on the third episode so i need to go go put that back in